Welcome to Not This, Not That, where we push our boundaries of understanding and perception. I am your host, Reverend Patricia Caginello, and I invite you to join me as we open to the possibility that things may not be exactly as you believe, as you've been told, that there could be more, that in our collective consciousness is the potential for the all. You can find Not This, Not That on sacredstoriesmedia.com and on iTunes and all streaming services on the Sacred Stories podcast. Today, we are expanding our boundaries of understanding on the power of conscious choice, and we have the great pleasure of speaking with award-winning spiritual mentor, author, host of the popular America Meditating Radio Show, and director of the Meditation Museums in Metropolitan Washington, D.C., Sister Jenna. Sister Jenna's mission is to decode critical current issues and offer a perspective for folks to find clarity, power, and insight. And it is my great pleasure to say, welcome to Not This, Not That, Sister Jenna. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Reverend Patricia. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited for our conversation because mm-hmm. you say, the power of conscious choice, you say that it is um, our ability to communicate from an awakened state can carry consequences for future generations. That's a powerful mm-hmm. statement. Can you, can you expand on that and why you say that? Sure. Well, I can definitely tell you from a very personal perspective. Um, in my younger days, which was just yesterday, <laughs> because we just got out of another year, um, in my 20s, um, you know, you have this attitude about you. You sort of walk around with a kind of a sense that there's no tomorrow and everything is about you and you've got everything together and from um, running my businesses and um, dating and doing this and doing that. There's just a sense that you had it together. You were going for the money. You were going for the relationship. You were going for your image. And so my decisions were so based on that premise. But then I was in a country um, at the time, and I was dating the son of the prime minister of that country. And I was walking around, uh, walking somewhere, and there was this inner... Feeling. It was as if I was watching a movie within my, my mind, but it was a very deep experience where I was the main, the main actor in that scene. And the main actor had like a road to Damascus, a turnaround. And something opened up in me where it was more, it wasn't just about me anymore. It was something that was higher than me. It was something that signaled to me that you could offer and be more than what you think you already have. So I would call it awakening, but it was this deep, deep feeling that I couldn't describe. It wasn't manipulated by drugs, alcohol, or doing any rituals. It just happened one day when I was walking around, this, this innate sense, this, this click, this, this signaling. And what it felt like, Patricia, was um, my heart, my love, my love for the self and humanity was getting signaled that there's more to you. And because my parents were practicing a spiritual tradition called Raj Yoga Meditation by the Brahma Kumaris, when I was 16, I was raised looking at these female yogis, these female Raj Yogis of the Brahma Kumaris for many years. I remember just looking at their beauty and their spiritual presence and their angelic presence and just would never think I could ever do that. That's just not going to work for me, you know? So it was after that experience of feeling like there was more that I can offer, I I would call it that was my awakening. Something popped in me, and I just wanted to be more, to give more, or I was just being led to give more. So then I watched that my decisions were no longer just based on my image, how much money I could make or who I needed to date, I found that my decision started to be more mindful, that I wasn't given sorrow or taking sorrow, but I was thinking about ideas and thoughts and decisions that could be more sustaining, more helpful. And you know what the weird thing is, Reverend Patricia? It would also make me feel like I wasn't at the forefront of it all, but I was sustaining the vision more from the background. So it was no longer about me. It was a feeling like I was just being an instrument of being used by God, by a higher power 
to begin to move a bigger story forward. So your awakening, and I'm speaking from a personal perspective, it just happened when something inside of the spirit signaled to me, it's beyond your image, just about you and your finances, just about who's at your, at your arm, or who's holding your arm. It's just bigger than you. So you're awake. You're like, there's more to it than just this. And that's how it was for me. So now my decisions are more based on how I can assist not only people, but through my assistance of people, it's coming from a place that I've assisted my own life at a spiritual level. So it's more of an awakening than coming from a selfish place. Did that make sense? Oh, absolutely. There's so much in what you just said. And what really resonated with me listening to you was, was two points I'd love to have you expand on. The first is that it, the power in something like that, it, it's a complete power shift. But how powerful is it to show up in our lives from that completely different perspective or expanded perspective that we speak about? Mm -hmm. um, and in, in that power, though, there's the paradox of you speaking that you know you're not alone, you don't have to be at the forefront, that you're actually in support and yeah. of, a, of a greater of a greater consciousness. And I think that is so important for people to get to because I think as spiritual leaders or people that are driven by the passion in our soul, right? We feel it, we know it, we want to be of greater service. I think that if we, we can almost trip ourselves up because we feel not that it's all about us, but that we almost have to just do it alone. And that perspective, is, is somewhat immobilizing also. It can be. I was on a flight to Oprah's home um, for a project we were working on called the Belief, the Belief um, TV series. And while I entered the flight, and you know, Oprah takes care of everything when, when you go to see her. And I always choose to fly just regular economy. And she gives you the opportunity. Do you want to fly business or first class? And I just, I, it's okay. You can use your money for something else. So as I'm on the flight, I'm passing by first class. And I saw another friend that was on the way to her home. And they were, he and his wife was in first class. So anyway, I'm in my economy seat. He comes back and we end up talking about life. And he made a very interesting statement. He said, I've sp spoken to so many of these award-winning authors and individuals that we're seeing, and they're struggling to pay their mortgage. And I thought to myself as I heard that, I said, yeah, I can understand that. Um, there's a price you pay when you sort of give up pushing your image in front of the world, and you begin to say, but you know what? I really am more pushing an experience. For me and for our community of the Brahma Kumaris, we're stewarding um, an experience that souls can feel a deeper link to source, to God, to the divine, so that they can feel safe and protected. And even in doing that, Reverend Patricia, you're still seen and you're still acknowledged. And even when you are seen and acknowledged, it's not what it's about. It's more about the service that you're offering to offer a deeper experience so folks can feel more secure. So the point that I'm making is sometimes we have to take a risk to say, if I can keep pushing the quality of my message or uh, the quality of a product or um, the experience more than me, then I really feel that we will be taken care of, we'll be provided. Um, because I feel that we get stuck if you try to push your image too much, you feel like you lose something very authentic about what you were really called for in the first place. Then you end up almost where you were before, you know, really playing the game of life when really it's about moving life with a passionate experience that you're going through. You're just sharing that with humanity. So what you speak about is a conscious choice. So even having said all that, we still have to wake up every morning, right, and make the conscious choice to move in that direction or have that perspective right mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and and in there is is our choice <laughs> the help help 
us understand how you continue to do that because putting the focus on the greater service is certainly one way and that can help. But, but myself also working towards the greater good or working for the greater good, I can personally say that you know, some days it's a little easier than others to stay in that beautiful mm-hmm. energy, right? Yeah, 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 some days it is. Um, I can, again, share from my experience because I have such a strong community background and such a foundation of so many yogis, it's sort of safe and secure. That's one, but it doesn't mean that I, I have to still rise and I'm independent and we still have to push our narrative forward. Um, I direct my ability to keep going forward because of my life of discipline. I don't know if you know this, Reverend Patricia, but my back in the days of business, I ran two nightclubs, one in South Florida, one in Key Biscayne. And that was in my 20s. I loved it. And, And I tell you, I don't mind repeating that story again. So knowing that I came from this background where I was going to bed at six, seven o'clock at night in the mornings, here I am now with this awakened conscious ability, and now I'm waking up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, sitting in silence every day, having um, a moment between I, the soul, and the supreme God energy, which is of love and peace and purity. And every day I try to practice remembering that I have this capacity of love and wisdom and, and, and truth in me. And so just imagine practicing getting up early by either an awakened conscious choice because you're so committed to a bigger picture. And then every day I um, experience and offer a teaching of meditation, six o'clock. I have my breakfast at eight o'clock. Every hour in the hour, I pause for something called traffic control for two minutes wherever I am. Every hour I'll pull back, pause, remember the soul, remember the supreme and pull those qualities in. And I'm continuously making decisions during the day doing that. So I definitely believe that for us to stay on track in faith, encouraged and empowered, believing that discipline doesn't mean control or being forced, but to practice a disciplined timetable for one's own life, which you will never you will never substitute it for anything else. So you won't even compromise it. Is actually giving the soul an element of freedom, which it really can't develop if it's just on its own accord. We have to make certain sacrifices within our own beings that we can start to feel a different kind of a sublime strength that emerges that begins to feel, I have enough, I can do it. On my down days and on my days where I don't feel so good, they're, they're normal. There are days that you just don't feel so good. However, there's a foundation that you know you can't go too low that you feel like you're at the point of no return because you've got community, you have friends, you have your fundamentals that you have to fulfill in your responsibilities, and they keep you going. And wisdom tells us nothing negative stays around you forever. So you're going to be fine. You just have those days. But I consistently believe that it's so important for when we are called to do something big, Reverend Patricia, that we remember that it's important that a disciplined timetable is indicative towards my ability to serve at a bigger level. Because you're letting go a lot of yourself and you're now opening up yourself for something higher. So it's just fascinating because again you're bringing forth another paradox because for those mm-hmm. of us that are following our soul's calling you know we just feel that we're just going to just just not rush in but we are just following spirit right and within mm-hmm. there there isn't a tremendous amount always of structure and but what you're saying is creating the framework a disciplined framework or a structured framework for you to work within, you actually allow your soul to expand even further within. Exactly. Right? You have that yes, I, yes. Yes, I totally believe that. You look at, and I'm, and I'm using this with respect, any military or any really big movement that needs to achieve victory or achieve something substantial, 
Um, and I use the military as an example many times because you enter into it and you have to go through this boot camp training where a, a high percentage of your ego has to get out of you. It has to leave that setting because if your ego comes into the play, it could mess up the real work that has to be done. So we have to go through all this breaking down of little issues and these little parts of our beings that we're still not in touch with. So when we make sacrifices and we do discipline ourselves and we, we make important hard calls, then it's as if it signals back to the soul that you really mean this. You really wish to serve at a higher level because I could see you're making certain choices that really will carry consequence that I have to take care of you because I see what you've sacrificed for the bigger picture. Yeah. So they're, yeah, they're like really deep, significant things that are so subtle. But until we, we really deeply have a conversation that says, are you really, you really mean that you really want to help humanity? Okay, so let's see if you're willing to give these things up for something bigger. And I've seen it in my life. You know what else this brings up, which I think is such an important point. It reminds me of the study that were that was done a number of years ago in, in children on the a playground. So the idea of just our psychological body, you know, what we feel safe and how we can as humans, right, with the human beings showing up in this world. So there was this briefly there was a study done and the children were on a playground and the playground had a fence around it. And the children played in the, in the entire playground. But the researchers thought, well, are we confining them? What would they do if we took the fence down? And they had complete freedom to go wherever they wanted. And so they took the fence down. And what was so interesting in the study is that the children kind of huddled together in the center. They actually restricted mm. their movements more. Um, mm because they didn't have the safety of the boundaries of the fence. Wow, I love that. Right? So as you yeah. right, navigating race right, powerful I, I, you know powerful spiritual beings navigating this human existence right now, I, I believe it's important that we understand and work within what we innately how we're innately wired and I believe that we yeah. do as you say do better or feel more confident within boundaries, within a construct that it doesn't mean it's confining to us. It actually allows us to expand even more. <laughs> Alanis Morissette and I were having a conversation on this and I'm Pisces. And we were talking about how um, I find that I don't do well with boundaries. And she was like, well, those sharks are going to come get you, Sister Jenna. <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, I, well, let me explain. And so I said to her, I found that when I'm in a very strong place within myself, when my spiritual truth is really purely emanating through me, I, and not, it's not that I even know that it is. I only am able to identify it by observing the outside scenes coming in. And when I'm in that state, what I've witnessed is that I'm protected because my stage of strength is so clear and it's pure that it's protecting anything outside that might be negative to try to come and destroy me or you know hurt me. However, when I found that my interior world has a little bit of issue, it's going through a little bit of high and low, a little bit of weakness and strength, I'm feeling a little vulnerable. Then I put up my boundaries because I'm not very strong at this time. So I'll put up my boundaries that will just like, please, you know, this has to stay away for a while. I need to build myself because we've seen what walls do. We'll see, we see what, you know, what happens when people do put up walls and, and, and limitations for people's lives that it, it lessens their capacity and it lessens even our ability to soar because we're in these very confined levels of thinking. So boundaries work for me when I'm spiritually not doing my best. But when I am in my best state, I don't need boundaries and I allow my spiritual capacity to be the boundary, the, the, the energy of light and love that really allows things to work in accordance to the universe. So I wanna to speak to that because I, too, I do believe that they're both 
they're both areas of that that we have been through in, in our lives. I don't necessarily believe that we should just live our life completely on boundaries because I think we, we let go of the inner deeper capacity of power that we need to develop so that that could be our protection and our gift to humanity as well. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And I, and I think words are funny. You know, the energy of words are funny. So what, mm-hmm. we're, what we're speaking about is having that larger construct that we've created, that discipline construct that you speak to, that allows us that container to expand. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I get that. Yeah. Language just gets us into trouble. It does. It does. But, but having said that, so getting into trouble, right? So we do that, right? We, we get a little bit off track sometimes. We all do. You know, that's just the beauty of yeah. part of our charm. When it happens to me, I say, oh, it's part of my charm coming out again. Oh, um, I do it every day. I do it every day. I get into trouble, but it's okay. I'm in the process. It's a, pro- it's a process. Someone told me that a long mm-hmm. time ago, and I'm still really un- uncovering what that really means. It's a process. But um, mm-hmm. but you you let's speak to meditation. You you run two meditation centers, very popular meditation centers in the metropolitan Washington D.C. area. How does meditation, as part of your process or the larger construct, how does that work for you? And how do you think it can be of service to others? Mm, thank you. Um, meditation uh, calls us to pay attention. Attention to our thoughts, the attention to what these thoughts are making the soul feel. And then it helps us to pay attention to the motive behind the decisions that we're about to make. When I'm not in a meditative state, uh, again, I go back to my age of my 20s where it's just about me, my image, money, what's, you know, modes of survival, even if it's at the consequence of someone else's happiness or freedom or what have you. So when you go on a path of meditation, you're actually becoming what I feel is like a mother of the earth. You're really looking at nurturing mankind at a higher level because now you are taking on that responsibility to nurture your own inner mankind or womankind. And when you meditate, it's such a private, personal effort. And so I find that through meditation, you are led to a form of victory that works for you, that is best for you. And victory is something very personal. But also, um, meditation helps you to collaborate, to cooperate, to integrate with others so that you can also experience a life of success. And I think success and victory are two different energies. You will find success in the collaboration with people, but you'll find your victory as a very personal agenda. And so when you're in the mode of victory, I believe that you are practicing meditation. Uh, The one that I practice is called Raj Yoga Meditation, which is taught by the Brahma Kumaris. And so every day, you know, I'm having this inner dialogue. Who am I? Who is God? What is this action about to reveal as a consequence in my life and the life of others? And then I really make a a concerted choice. I don't know if I want to choose to do this. It's going to give too much sorrow, so I'll choose to do this. So it helps us to pause, Reverend Patricia. It gives us a moment to pause and think in spirit, in truth, in purity, in peace, in godliness. And then it allows you to make decisions that will keep your mind at ease and at peace with yourself and with others around you. So the Meditation Museum opened up, um, I think about now, it's been almost 10 years. And Washington has had 198 museums. And I passed by the Crime and Punishment Museum Mm -hmm. uh, years ago. And I said, what in the world why would you open up a museum for crime and punishment and i thought i'm going to do a meditation museum that is it you can't have a museum that creates so much pain when people walk in so Mm -hmm. we decided to do um, the meditation museum and my very best friend the, the honorable harriet fulbright she and i worked on it to get the narrative in place and she said sister jenna if this really takes off in washington please know and trust what you're doing is a really good thing for this country and for the world. And it has, and we're very humbled by it. 
So that brings us back to the power of conscious choice, right? So <laughs> yeah, people that was a conscious choice. <laughs> conscious choice. People have the conscious choice on where they spend their time, what they dip their energy into, you know, what they think about. And so while a museum on crime and punishment, for an example, might be, you know, fascinating to some degree, the conscious mm -hmm. choice, right, to visit the meditation museums or to engage in in you know a higher consciousness as far as how we show up what we choose to do you know the integrity that we walk in this world and where we want to put right. our focus right you know we all right. have that power to make those kinds correct and you know uh, sorry reverend patricia sometimes we look at consciousness it's such a broad word i remembered i was interviewing congressman tim ryan in capitol hill who um, organizes a meditation group in Capitol Hill. And in my television interview with Congressman Ryan, I asked him what was consciousness to him. And it was such a large question that, you know, you kind of look at consciousness sort of like so large, it's the all. And at the end of the conversation and after even the cameras were off, we went into a deeper interpretation of consciousness. And I think that there are two kinds. There's a consciousness that it has a clean conscience. It's where your conscience won't bite you. You won't have a duality of, is this what I should do? Is this the right thing? Then you have the consciousness that is very human, selfishly driven. I call it body consciousness. So that's where your conscience will bite. Your conscience says, you shouldn't do that. Why are you doing it? Why are you voting for that? Why are you voting for this person? Why are you about to choose to do that? It's going to give sorrow. And that conscience that's biting you is feeding the consciousness of the limited, the body, the fear, the pain, the limited. And so we must understand that there are two levels of consciousness. And when you're in or on a path of meditation and spirituality, your inner being is saying, I want a conscience that is clean and pure, that won't bite me back and says, you know, um, you're not doing the right thing. I want my conscience to say, God will be proud of you because this decision is one that he would make. So back to the conscious choice narrative is everyone who's listening on, please check your conscience if you want to understand what part of consciousness you're feeding. Is it the unlimited or the limited? Is it the pure or the not so pure? Is it the light or is it the dark? And so if you can feed more the light, then you're really living in your soul awareness, your soul consciousness, your higher consciousness. But if it's giving sorrow to others, and if you're taking sorrow from others, then you're feeding the consciousness of the limited, then you're, the soul is feeling pain. So stop, make a decision. This is not where I want to go. This is keeping me asleep and putting me to sleep. Mm -hmm. Sister Jenna, how would you define God um, for our audience? Beautiful question. God is an ocean of love, peace, purity, truth, and joy. We're not born with a religion, but we're born with these qualities. And over a period of time, these qualities of God energy, this, these qualities of God seeped out. It just kind of leaked out of the soul. So now we're looking at the world right now where there's a deep need for all of us, all seven point something billion of us, to begin to go inwards first and, and recognize that there was once a soul that had innocence that was like a child, that I am worthy enough to emanate these qualities like a child with wisdom now and maturity. But in order for me to sustain it and to really deeply believe in it, I connect to an understanding that God is a supreme being of these qualities that I now lack, love, peace, purity, truth, and joy. And we have given up these qualities of godliness for an acronym I use in every interview I've ever done in my life, ALGI. A for anger, L for lust. G for greed, A for attachment, and E for ego. And if you look at the world right now, if you look at the condition of our world, so much of these vices 
are in our choices. So if these if these vices are at the base of our choices, then imagine what the consequence of that will be. So now when I begin to say, but I have God's energies in me, I have God's qualities in me, God is the supreme being, he is available now more than ever, more than ever God's energy is available now. That he's saying, look kids, it's getting worse. Just remember me, turn to me, walk in my remembrance, eat in my remembrance, speak in my remembrance, and you will begin to pull back, reclaim your love that was at the capacity of an ocean, your peace that was at the capacity of an ocean, your truth, your wisdom, your joy. And when, I, when you can see that within you and with others, you will say, I'm, I'm here. God is here. God is present. God is everywhere. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I look at God as an experience and an energy that exists as a remembrance. I, I can't say that Hinduism has authority of God. Christianity has authority of God. Islam has an authority of God. I look at religions where their language, their culture, their rituals resonate with my karmic present story, which I've been born into. But as I awaken more deeper in my spirituality, I realize I don't need to connect to God through religion. I need to connect to God through silence and through having a truthful spirit, because that's how I could feel that pure, subtle energy back in my system. Because algae has taken me so much away from it that now I'm really needing to test myself. And again, go back to our earlier conversation. Discipline, sacrifice will make me reconnect to God's power because I need that energy to get out of where I am right now. This algae consciousness, it's so unhealthy, but yet it's a pathway to return us to God's love and peace and purity. So you say God is everywhere, and, and you've spoken of spiritual community. You've created spiritual community with your yeah. radio show and with your meditation museums and, and, and many, other, many other projects. And what's okay. so beautiful that, that I believe about you, because you're really, really, really walking the walk, right? So you're yeah. currently right, right, expanding, right? So we're going to expand our consciousness. We're going to create spiritual community. God is everywhere. and and God is in everyone, you recently released a new CD called Inclusion Revolution, which you produced along with a hip-hop artist. So tell us how a yogi sister ended up collaborating with a hip-hop artist, right? And, and, and tie that into what we've been speaking about, which is the, sure. the idea of that larger spiritual community and construct where we can expand. Sure, Reverend Patricia. Just for clarity, when I said that God is everywhere, it's after we've done our work and we've reclaimed his experience within our being, that if really many of us begin to emanate those qualities, then we can feel that he's everywhere. Now we're wondering, where is he? Because what we're seeing is algae in the, in, the, in the space, and we don't want algae anymore as leadership in our lives. And so this is where the work has to happen. And then we can say, God, really, his energy is in me. So I wanted to clarify that. So I think that it's my deep experience of the divine that offers me an opportunity to enter into every spectrum of life. And because I wasn't, you know, educated on the hip hop industry, and I used to hold reservations about the energy that it was propagating. I wanted to know more, Reverend Patricia. And so I found this local artist in DC, Joe Rob, and um, I've been really thinking about creating a meditation groove, which isn't just about sitting down, but you could do it when you're riding your, you know, the, the cycle or walking the treadmill or heading to work or another meeting. So it would keep your spirits up. Do you know what I mean? Like I want my spirits to be kept up. So listen to this part. In the inclusion revolution, together with love, I've taken the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, the preamble, the resistance movement, and a few other areas, and I've looked at the words, and I've done a meditation on them, also sort of refining what the words meant if we all felt that we belonged to this story. 
because I live a life of inclusivity. So it's in my fiber. It's just natural for me to bring the world together. It's just who I am. And so doing this CD was my gift to humanity to have very positive and to offer a very positive and bold message that would make us feel like I'm, it's okay for me to learn more about someone that's different than I am. And I think I marvel at the beauty that can come out of when people of different backgrounds, different colors, different religions bring their gifts into an idea or a project and see how it contributes to the well-being of our humanity. So the album is powerful. It's one of my favorites. And um, some folks have special favorite tracks like the Positive Resistance Movement or the Letting Go one. The one that's free of attachment is also a lot of people love that one. And so I did the album because of what we went through in 2017. And I think we're going to need to have more positive messaging so we can feel a little bit more courageous. Sister Jenna, that sounds like an absolutely fascinating album. Please tell our audience where they can find it. Sure. They can go onto iTunes, Amazon, and all they have to do is Google Inclusion Revolution Together with Love by Sister Jenna, or visit my website at americameditating.org for all the information on America Meditating and its movement. But if you're local and you want to come to one of our meditation centers or museums, then just go to brahmakumaris.org, B-R-A-H-M-A-K-U-M-A-R-I-S.org. Mm -hmm. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Sister Jenna, this has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you about Mine the, power, the power of conscious choice. I want to just give you just a, a final opportunity, any final thoughts you'd like to leave our audience with. I think it's time for us to come together. It's time for us to not be silenced by our good. And it's time for us to believe in God's powers and God's love that perhaps the incredible intense times that we've been through in the last year or two is that we're being called to love God more, to eat with God, to sit with God, to make decisions with God. And I don't mean a God that's scary or belonging to one person, talking about a God that understands universal laws and has respect and kindness and purity of intention and motive. That's the God I'm talking about. So bring that energy into your everything and you'll be fine. Thank you so very much, Sister Jenna. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Mine too. All the best. And thank you to our audience. For listening. I am your host, Reverend Patricia Caginello, and you have been listening to Not This, Not That on Sacred Stories podcast.